Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last session of the first day of the HLFC conference. We are in a world, we're living in a world where there is unfortunately a surge of violence and conflict. Added to the violence and conflict, there are devastating climate emergencies and we are still living with the impact of COVID-19. We're coping with severe food insecurity and also increasing attacks on schools. Right now, there are 103 million forcibly displaced persons worldwide. And among those, there are 103 million forcibly displaced. 53 million are internally displaced. And of that, children count for 42% of all forcibly displaced people. So almost half are children. In Sub-Saharan Africa, children are estimated to represent even more than that, almost 55% of these populations. As we know, 220 million crisis-affected children are in need of education, of which 54% are girls out of school. So clearly, education is in peril for those left furthest behind in emergencies and in protracted crises. You know, there's a saying uh, that I always have in the back of my mind because I, I'm a communicator, and uh, the statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. So we need stories like Zaya's and uh, try to try to you know, imagine who is that child, who is that girl, who is that boy, who is that adolescent whose life has been affected, and how can we play our part to lift their lives through education. So I am really pleased to host a panel session with some very special people who are completely devoted uh, to the cause of people who are uprooted and to answer these questions. Um, and so I'd first like to introduce our panelists and ask them to come to the stage. Ms. Aloya Stella Oryang, who is a South Sudanese refugee teacher who is living in Uganda and working. And she's a member of the Uganda National Teachers Union, UNATU. <laughs> Stella. Oh, she came. Uh, and then Mr. Filippo Grandi, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. Philippe Lazzarini, Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works, and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East. I think better known and more simply put as UNRWA. Ms. Pauline Gavarinia Betancourt, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons. And His Excellency Hernando Bayona, who is the Deputy Minister of Pre-Primary, Primary, and Secondary Education of Colombia. And last but not least, His Excellency Alan Hama Sayed Sali, who is the Minister of Education from the Kurdistan Regional Government of Iraq. So, Stella. I'm going to start with you. Based on your experience as a South Sudanese refugee and a teacher in Uganda, what do you think is needed? I mean, we know the situation is acute. There are so many refugees and probably even more coming by the day. So are there enough teachers, including refugee teachers, who are qualified, recognized, and also valued to respond to the needs of refugee children and children in host communities. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Aloyo Stella Oryang, a South Sudanese refugee teacher in Palabek Refugee Settlement in Uganda. Being a teacher is the most important thing I've ever done in my life. A passion I pursued, not because of a chance, but a dream to become a teacher, to be able to serve, 
the children and the entire community. To be there for the children, to teach them, mentor them, teach them life skills, offer them psychosocial support, and reassure them every day that every one day everything would just be fine. Despite my effort, many things I cannot do. I am the only refugee teacher at my school. I teach about 200 learners in a school having a population of about 2,500 children. Out of these, 95% are refugees. How can I teach all these learners to understand reading and writing? Or how would you do it if you were in my shoes? I wish you could just stand in my shoes for an hour. You would understand where I am coming from. And that is the reason as to why we need to have enough teachers at school, because I strongly believe that there is no better and safer place for our children and youths other than the school. And this is a collective responsibility. I hereby call upon the government of South Sudan I call upon the government of Uganda. I call upon all corporate bodies. I call upon development partners and every well-wisher out there to invest in education. Increase the funding so that we are able to recruit enough teachers at school. Pay them well and in time. Just to cite an example, I earn about USD 120 per month in Uganda. How much money is that? And what can that money do for a normal person? That is why teacher salary enhancement should remain an agenda for consideration. This inconsideration is making us refugee teachers to suffer a lot at school. Most of the host community teachers are running away because the salary is small. They are going for government jobs because it is better paying. I cannot run away. When I look into the eyes of my learners, I just cannot leave. Sometimes I am like, is it because I am a refugee? Is that the reason why I must suffer? But again, I console myself and I'm like, no, it's because not everyone has prioritized education. And I think that is the reason for which we are gathered here today. Teachers need continuous professional development. We need in-service training. We need capacity building so that we update and upgrade our knowledge. This is more important for refugee teachers, especially us from South Sudan. We hold a different qualification other than Uganda's. So to fit into Uganda's system, we need an in-service program. I must appreciate Uganda National Teachers Union for bridging the gap but there is still a gap remaining to ensure that every refugee teacher from South Sudan continue to teach in Ugandan schools. Many times, teachers' issues are disregarded. They are not taken as important. People prioritize the children. But if I may ask a question, what is education without the teachers? Why should we have the 222 million youths and children at school when we don't have teachers who are recognized and valued. I think this should be a common call for all of us in this room. Teaching is a passion, teaching is a call that we are here to do as teachers. But again, that needs support. As I conclude, our work to the children are critical. I am doing my part, do your part. Thank you so much.
Stella, it is so clear that your, your statement resonated with our audience here so much. And I think you're not only speaking for the refugee teachers in Uganda, I think you're, teaching, you're speaking for the teachers in crisis situations all over the world um, and the important role that you have, not just, as you said, in teaching math and teaching reading, but in helping students overcome their trauma. That you shouldn't be 200 to you in a classroom. And this is a good segue. Now we have uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees with us here who has been to Uganda many, many times, has, I'm sure, visited one of the schools. And I would like to ask you just first to react um, to what you heard and, and also what you think about um, the inclusion of refugee children in national education, because that's another, I think, priority of the UN UNHCR's education strategy. Um, and maybe I'll just have a quick follow-up question after you answer that. I think it works. It works? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Laya. That was the best way to start and makes it very difficult for whoever speaks after you. But I, you know, I, after so many years working with refugees and people on the move, we have a saying in UNHCR, it's not a saying, it's a technical definition that refugees are people that have lost their national protection, their protection of their state, of their country. That's why they have to leave and seek protection somewhere else. And uh, in fact, when you think of the multiple losses that a refugee has to go through, abandoning everything, I can hardly see anything worse than losing, for children, to lose education. Education as a foundation of their life, as the building block for the future. And you know, refu for refugees, the biggest trauma or the biggest anxiety is not to have hope in that future, not to see any light that gives hope for the future. And education gives that light. You know, I've worked, and we'll hear from Philippe, I'm sure, and, uh, and others. You know, I've worked uh, with Palestinian refugees. I've worked a lot with Afghan refugees. I loved, I've worked with Congolese refugees or refugees in Congo. And everywhere I have been, no matter the region, the culture, the circumstances, I was always struck by how much parents were ready to give up to ensure that their kids in exile would receive education. That's why I think, you know, the focus of education cannot wait on crisis and within that on refugees, on displaced people is so fundamental because education is important for everybody, but perhaps even more important for people that have lost everything. So very, very important to invest. I want to say only one more thing, a bit more technical perhaps, but very important. And, you know, uh, I, Yasmin and I have discussed this so many times. The importance, the, the approach that my organization and others are promoting is to try to get away from building dedicated systems, education systems for refugees, but rather to promote that refugees, wherever they are, are included in national systems to the extent that this is possible. Not every country can do it. Not, not every country wants to do it, although a majority do, but it is important. What Alaya said is exactly that. Uganda is one of the most open countries in the world in allowing refugees to have access to their services. And, uh, but then the next step is look at the challenges that this presents. Uganda is not a country with many means. And uh, in order to support teachers, structures, space, uh, development of special aspect of the curriculum in order for 
refugee kids to have language support, for example. Maybe not a big problem in Uganda, but in other places a big problem. So all of this costs money that these countries often do not have. This is where international support is crucial. This is one of the foundation, if you wish, of the Global Compact on Refugees, inclusion in national systems and education in particular. And this is one of the key themes that we uh, uh, promoted in the first Global Refugee Forum that will be a key theme at the Global Refugee Forum in December this year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you. I, I often think of education, it's like the Maslow pyramid of human needs, and the funders often cut off at the kind of survival stage, you know, shelter and food. And then when it gets to the self-actualization, which is education, which is the future, the funding is not there. So, but every human being has this need. So it's great to see all the progress and also the, the, the push that UNHCR is giving education. So I'd like to move now to Commissioner General Lazzarini the UNRWA education model, whereby UNRWA is running its own full-fledged schooling system, is considered a success story. Mm. It's also highly praised. UNRWA has ensured that education services have continued despite all the worst of the crises that we hear and see on the news uh, continuously. So what, in your view, should be done to protect these advances and to make sure that UNRWA can continue running the education system as long as it's needed. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And <clears throat> as you said, UNRWA's education is certainly a collective success story in uh, the region. We have graduated more than two million uh, people. Who, many of them became engineers, doctors, uh, teachers, and have contributed to the prosperity of the region. I have to say that whenever I travel uh, in, in, in Europe or elsewhere, I meet, when I meet uh, the Palestinian diaspora, I meet many former alumni of uh, the UNRWA schools, uh, and they always make, after that, the pride of their communities. We have today 550,000 girls and, 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 and boys in our school across the region. We are certainly the only organization having a human right uh, curriculum in the region. We have reached uh, gender parity decades ago. And on top of that, we are also investing a lot in vocational training to make sure that uh, uh, the youth uh, can compete uh, in uh, the uh, job market in the region. We have also been pioneer in education in uh, emergency. Uh, providing mainly distance learning, whether in case of conflict uh, or pandemic, uh, by, for example, providing lessons through YouTube uh, channel or also developing digital platform uh, learning. And most of the time, in case of conflict, and this region is hit by a number of uh, conflict, uh, our schools are also becoming the safe haven for a number of children. And we know that in, at the center of all this uh, are the 22,000 teachers working for the organization. Now, we have challenges ahead of us, uh, and the main challenge is that we are dealing in a region where we have the longest unresolved uh, conflict ever. And because of that, uh, the attention of the international community is not as high as it used to be. And in fact, we noticed uh, that the Israel-Palestinian conflict 10 years ago started to be deprioritized, and as a consequence, uh, the resources to an agency like UNRWA started to cap, forcing the agency after that to implement austerity measures, which in terms of education means today we have up to 50 kids in a classroom. We have one teacher up to six being a daily uh, a worker. So all most of the schools today are in a double shift. In addition, we have seen, with a number of uh, crises hitting the region, an increased abject poverty among the Palestinian refugees, and more and more we have reports talking about uh, early marriage, 
uh, uh, child trafficking, domestic violence, gender-based violence, which are not environment conducive uh, for a quality uh, lear uh, learning. And finally, like everyone, we have also registered uh, a number of losses uh, related uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the COVID. Uh, and the distance learning also had its own limitation because if you try to learn from an overcrowded refugee camp uh, with substandard dwellings, uh, no connectivity, whatever uh, platform you offer, if you do not have the tablet and not the connectivity, you will lose, like anyone else, uh, some teaching. Now, going ahead, how do we do to try to preserve uh, uh, all the extraordinary gain we have registered for decades in the region. I mean, the, the, the first one, I mean, we will not be able to have a lasting solution if the conflict per se is not dealt with. And unfortunately today, we are in a situation 75 years later where the resolution of this conflict has never sounded so far away. But meanwhile, we have to reiterate our commitment to the Palestinian refugees as members of the international community. And this is the reason why, as an agency, we keep uh, hammering about the need of uh, predictable funding. We provide public-like services, like a Minister of Education, without the financial tool, without the fiscal tools. And hence, we need a commitment from the member states uh, to fund or continue to ensure quality education to the children. Besides that, like anyone else, keeping the school open is not enough. We will need to partner in order to address all the losses registered over the last few uh, years uh, in trying to address uh, most of the barrier related to education and to the dropping in uh, our school. And last but not least, as an agency, we have, to decide, uh, we have decided to invest massively, but again, we need the resource, uh, into a digital transformation of the education. Number one, to make sure in the future that whenever we have to shift back to distance learning, that we can do it uh, properly, but also to make sure that the Palestinian refugees will basically have only, only education have never been taken away from them. Uh, do not miss the train of digitalization. We had recently extraordinary success, like in Gaza, where, for example, 120 uh, 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 tech uh, users are providing information technology and communication solution for the global UN system nowadays. And this is doable. So thank you, Anissa. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for end ending on that uh, inspirational note, um, because it is rather depressing, the picture you painted. Um, that said, I think Stella would be happy to have only 50 students <laughs> in her classroom, so a slight improvement, but obviously the need for funding and most of all, the need for peace. Um, aid to education accounts for only 3% of global humanitarian funding, only 3%, making it one of the least funded humanitarian areas. Education is also a human right of internally displaced peoples, children and youth, left behind, probably even more so in most humanitarian responses. So to my right, I would like to ask Paulina Gabarina Betancourt, who is, as I mentioned before, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons. What do you think can be better understood and consequently done to give displaced children better prospects for their future? <laughs> do I need the microphone? I think do, you do don't you need it, me? actually. Yeah, yeah, I, yep, think I think I you're don't. all mic'd up. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Melissa, for, for the question. and. Um, I'm very happy to be sharing this, this panel with the distinguished excellencies. Uh, and I would like to especially acknowledge and, and welcome the youth advocates present in the room. I think the, the conference made an effort mm. to, to put their voice at the front. So your voices and decisions that affect you uh, matter most. Don't let us ever forget that. I wanted to start from there. And distinguished um, delegates, the number of internally displaced persons climb steadily 
over the past decade, with tens of millions of people forced to flee their homes each year. You already mentioned the figures, uh, Melissa, and many of them trapped in protected displacement. It is estimated that by the end of 2021, 25.2 million persons under 18 were living in internal displacement. And these numbers tend to rise, as we all know. Displacement disproportionately affects children, but their specific plight and vulnerabilities tend to disappear among the various groups considered under the umbrella of IDPs and children on the move. But being displaced shapes a child's life experience with impacts that can be very deep and irreversible. The Convention on the Rights of Child, the most widely ratified human rights instrument, does not allow for any derogation in times of emergency and recognizes that children who live in exceptionally difficult conditions need special consideration. The 1998 Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement, whose 25th anniversary we commemorate this year, further reinforce the principle of non-discrimination. The principles state that authorities shall ensure that internally displaced children receive free and compulsory education at the primary level, that education should respect their cultural identity, language, and religion, and that special efforts should be made to ensure the full and equal participation of girls in educational environments. Despite significant evidence demonstrating that access to quality education is crucial in providing life-sustaining protection, that education is a building block of recovery, and that equitable quality education is key for enduring long-lasting solutions, there is still a significant lack of global data on funding for the education of internally displaced children. In fulfilling my mandate, I will be calling upon states to make sure there are laws, policies, and public services that are inclusive of IDP's children, and that there is more investment in public infrastructure, support, support for teachers, and specific assistance for displaced children. It is paramount to ensure long-term, reliable, and comprehensive support that takes into account their specific needs. This means providing fast-track pertinent programs to those left behind. Here, the community-based learning can be also a useful interim measure in cases where the local education system was severely disrupted or absent. This also means giving special attention to psychosocial effects. Here, I want to emphasize the importance of equipping teachers and social workers with the necessary tools to facilitate the adaptation of displaced children to their new reality and to provide support to those dealing with post-traumatic stress derived from their situation of displacement. Teachers like Stella and children need to have the tools to develop resilience so they can cope with stress and adverse situations and reinterpret their surrounding new reality. It is also important to tackle a specific gender and disability-related barriers and strengthen educational systems so that they can provide high-quality learning opportunities. Support for the strengthening of national and local child protection systems, as Filippo said, should be increased through area-based approaches that consider the situation of host communities. Multi-year collaborative and flexible funding should be the norm and should be increased to fill the gap and ensure adequate state budget allocations for the rise of the internal displaced children. Finally, I wish to emphasize that states have the primary responsibility to provide protection and assistance to internal displaced children within their, juris their jurisdiction without any discrimination. The international community must support governments to overcome political and operational challenges so that they can enact policy changes and allocate funding to ensure all displaced children are included in national educational systems. Like Stella said, this is a collective responsibility. We cannot fail her or the other teachers and children. My mandate will continue to support this effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paulina. I liked what you said about education being the building block of recovery, and that needs to be realized, non-discrimination as well. 
I think we turn to a country that has enormous levels of internal force displacement. Deputy Minister Fiona, Colombia has had to deal with um, all of this internal force displacement because of years of armed conflict and continued arrival also over the past years of high numbers of refugees and migrants from Venezuela. Colombia is currently host to 5.2 million IDPs and 2.5 million Venezuelans, all in need of protection, some in need of international protection. Forced displacement has created also an additional layer of complexity. So Deputy Minister, these figures are staggering. Can you tell us a bit about the policies your government put in place to cope, and also what is needed to ensure that all of these children in situations of forced displacement can have quality education? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this panel and to share the magnitude of IPs, IDPs in Colombia. We are um, suffering violence, climate change, and migration. So please allow me to provide you a little bit of context of the situation in our country. Out of the 52 million inhabitants, Colombia has 9.5 million people are in the single register of victims. Out of these victims, 2 million are in school age, and most of them are in the education system. Colombia is marked by a history of violence for more than 60 years. And it's only now that we are walking the walk to total peace. Um, the situation, the geographical situation of Colombia places us in a vulnerable situation for climate disasters. The last season of uh, rainfall affected more than 3,000 schools, leaving all of the school children with no classroom available. Today, Ariño Department, a region placed in the south of Colombia, is practically isolated because of landsliding and totally blocked. On the other hand, up to now, we have registered practically 2.8 million migrants. More than 700,000 are in school age. So Colombia has made incredible effort to guarantee the right to education of their population. But so far, our education system has only managed to cover 84 percent. Behind those figures, there's people, parents, children suffering from violence in different ways and manners, suffering from climate change, suffering from the drama of migration thus being affected in the right to education. In Colombia, education is in constant crisis, seemingly. So we are designing forever different strategies to have access and permanent quality standards. And this is only possible when there are local governments and collaboration of NGOs and international cooperation. Some of the actions we've carried out so far are like making the requirements more flexible to have access to education on the part of the migrants, to driving further progress in the non-documenting migrant process to make the situation uh, official, to facilitate the validation of studies and diplomas coming from other countries, to strengthen the information system, thus identifying the needs and the follow-up requirements. We have declared a situation of emergency so that we can have resources to rebuild those schools that were shuttered by the climate disasters last year. And yet, this is not enough. Ladies and gentlemen, we need um, daring measures breaking away from inertia before this complexity to make Colombia a worldwide power of life, the current government proposes to focus on education with the idea that peace and education are one single project. And walking along those lines, we are devising different strategies to further drive social uh, support uh, and education 
education, more than 40,000 students at university and in school will be involved in programs that would support the educational process in rural schools that are more vulnerable and struck by catastrophes. Two, uh, give further content to the school curricula, integrating culture, sports, arts, science, citizenship, and education for a piece, to guarantee universal access to food system in the schools, to develop a very strong and aggressive improvement to strengthen our infrastructures in Colombia, to uh, implement a fast acting program through the welfare, citizenship, and peace program. Our country has been very brave in making schools a safe and protected area. This is something that was confirmed with the signature of the Declaration of Safe, Secure Schools. Making children the focus of total peace is clear that the country has made progress. And yet, the historical conflict, all of the climate conflict and the migrants place us in a situation of permanent emergency. This is why we're making a call, a global call to social mobilization for education in Colombia. We will continue supporting and building this program in a determined fashion, being leaders. But we require the solidarity from each and every one of you in this room. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. That is an incredible pledge. And I think we all should give another round of applause for Colombia making both peace and education one single project, in your words. Amazing. I now turn to Minister Saeed. Um, according to data by the Kurdistan Regional Government, KRG, Ministry of Interior's Bureau of Migration and Displacement, you have about 665,000 IDPs and more than 248,000 refugees. And who have settled in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. The KRG launched the Refugee Education Integration Policy, which very exemplary, exemplarily allows refugee and asylum-seeking children in the Kurdistan region of Iraq to enroll in government schools, in both camp as well as in urban settings. Your Excellency, could you please tell us about this integration? Um, and the intentions of your government and any challenges faced in the, in, in the implementation of these policies. Okay. Uh, Before answering your question, the main, uh, the main uh, objectives of uh, the inclusion of the Syrian refugees in our uh, government schools, I, w uh, I would like to uh, uh, highlight the fact that in 2014, there were developments in Syria and in Iraq due to the civil wars and internal wars. and also because of Daesh that uh, entered Mosul and different uh, the, uh, governorates in Iraq. Uh, Kurdistan was the, uh, was, was the safe haven for the refugees, but we still faced the different, uh, different problems. So uh, a lot of uh, people entered uh, our uh, directorates and uh, the number of refugees, Syrian refugees, also entered uh, Kurdistan. Based on uh, the uh, on the directives of our government, especially our prime minister, we provided the learning opportunities to the refugees and the internally displaced, especially the IDPs, working with. Uh, international uh, international organizations and we built schools uh, uh, we built schools in order to guarantee education to these children and now to answer your question 
about the most important objectives of our uh, policy of inclusion and what were the uh, the issues we faced in uh, the Kurdistan region, uh, region we ha we have more than 65 um, million uh, excuse me 65,000 refugees and we have managed to enroll almost 46,000 uh, uh, Syrian students in our local schools. Before that, the number of uh, student refugees was 32,000. But in the, ac in the current academic year, our government uh, uh, approved the inclusion of the Syrian refugees in local schools. In uh, primary school and primary schools until grade four and with that the number of enrolled children increased and the number reached around 46,000 Syrian children enrolled in uh, our schools in the uh, Kurdistan region what's the target what's our objective our objective is to highlight the fact that the uh, education right is a, a, a fundamental a, a fundamental right. Therefore, working with international organizations and with, uh, with the efforts of different uh, ministries in our government, we managed to guarantee this, uh, this right to, our, to the children, refugee children. There were some problems that we faced uh, in order to uh, in the implementation of this uh, of this uh, policy. In general, there is a huge number of internally displaced uh, displaced in Iraq, and we have uh, we have specified that around 150 schools in our region uh, they guaranteed two different shifts. Uh, these. Schools also were, are supposed to guarantee uh, education so for these children, but we have a lack of a number uh, of a number of schools, and the infrastructures also are not well put into place to do uh, to guarantee this education. Therefore, the uh, the uh, the local government schools became online schools especially after the enrollment of the uh, refugee students in our local government schools so it was we were it was limited it was a limited expansion for us on a uh, on a techno technological level because of the lack of infrastructures we had we needed more resources but we as a government believe that the education is a right for all people and we are pushing forward we are paying the salaries of 1000 Syrian teachers m since 2016 uh, 2016 and we have provided them with monthly uh, monthly salaries in our schools and this success story is that we have enrolled children refugees in our schools in in about a thousand school government school so these were the problems we have faced but we are still continuing to go forward and we will never stop our efforts and we thank the uh, international organizations for their efforts as well in helping us to become a success story in uh, in guaranteeing the education right as a right, a fundamental right for everyone. And thank you. I think uh, we'll hear from Philipp Filippo Grandi in a moment, but I think he will agree that that is the basis for the have the government guarantee that mm -hmm. fundamental right and the inclusion and to pay a thousand Syrian teachers and which leads to integration in a thousand government schools. That is an accomplishment. Thank you for sharing that. And I'd like, I know that the High Commissioner for Refugees has been to all of these situations, not just once, but many times. I know that you always make a point also of visiting the schools and talking to the children, seeing their faces, asking them questions, uh, asking them what they need, um, and then insisting with your government counterparts um, on their future education. 
you've just listened to these remarkable speakers. How would you, you how, what are your reflections? Thank you, Melissa. Indeed, I've been to these and other situations, sometimes with you, by the way. <laughs> yes. And uh, I think um, it is a priority. And I just have a few con concluding or wrapping up remarks that were inspired by the various interventions. It's interesting, we heard it from many angles, the importance of paying attention to education in situations of crisis and uh, the importance of inclusion. Um, I think on the first point, and I want to really pay tribute again to Education Cannot Wait for, as an initiative, as a project, uh, with many stakeholders, all of us, it has really helped uh, put and keep education in focus. To, like you said, Melissa, earlier, is education is as important as other sectors that are usually looked at immediately in a, an emergency response. But we need to also learn more not just to say it, but to do it, to respond. And responses are complex. You know, I, last week I was in Tigray. For now we are able to have access again to northern Ethiopia after the peace agreement or the cessation of hostilities. And you know, there's a huge problem of education interrupted in that area because of the conflict. And the complexity is very big. You have a lot of internally displaced people that not only could not go to school, but also had to be accommodated in schools because that was the only place where they could stay by thousands and thousands. So you have to now find accommodation, helping them return, restore uh, the, the, the education system. So it's a, in crisis, education is a complex matter that needs to be looked at in all its complexity and not only in some uh, aspects of it. And of course, there is a strong element of infrastructure that needs to be invested in, but also uh, many, many other uh, aspects. And one of them that I think came across very strongly, starting from Stella and then to other speakers, is the quality of education. We cannot simply say people in exile, people on the move need education. They need education of a certain quality. And that quality comes essentially with good teachers and enough teachers and uh, the right tools. The, uh, uh, the other uh, theme that I think is strong in this panel, and uh, we heard it both from the two government representatives in particular, is inclusion. And I mentioned this in the beginning. And I think this is a very important one. I, I feel a bit of a broken record because I always repeat this, but I am a strong believer. And we have here two fantastic examples of two governments that have been really ahead in uh, 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 um, promoting an inclusive approach for people that are uh, uh, on the move. You know, the efforts that we have made for years now since the compact and and uh, together with development organizations like the World Bank, like bilaterals, like the private sector in many places, to promote inclusion is paying off. And now we see, you know, if you take uh, statistics, I know statistics are always numbers, but, you know, I remember a few years back, we estimated the number of children enrolled in, refugee children enrolled in primary education was about 50%. Now it's closer to 70%. So it does pay, pay off. We should not always look at it as a problem. All this work, all this advocacy that you are also, all of, all of you are doing, is paying off and giving some result. And look, I want to give you one obvious big example. Look at what European countries are doing for Ukrainian children. You know, from day one, almost day one, or week one, let's put it that, they, you know, temporary protection was declared for all Ukrainian refugees. Temporary protection status meant that refugee children had access to education. Now, the implementation of that is complicated, but that was a choice, a political choice, made by governments in respect of this particular group of refugees. Now, I'm, 
I always tell the European governments, if you can do it for Ukrainian children, surely you can do it for other refugees and you can support <laughs> and you and you can and you can support countries in less uh, uh, privileged and less well-resourced parts of the world that are making big efforts to include, to do their work. I want to make, if you allow me, is a little pitch uh, after what Philippe said um, for Palestinian refugees and in general for refugees that are sidelined, forgotten, as Philippe said. You know, I was one of his predecessors in his job, so I feel very strongly for that, but it is important. And what UNRWA is doing is invaluable and has kept generations of Palestinians with a little bit of hope. So I hope that, that appeal, those appeals will be heeded. And the final point that I think is perhaps the most important, and I was inspired by Hernando in this respect, and uh, Melissa, you picked it up. This is the relationship between education and peace. Mm -hmm. It has so many aspects of it. One of it being, by the way, that we talk a lot about refugees. We should remember that there are other people on the move, like internally displaced people, that often have issues of exclusion and uh, 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 being victims of conflict. I think we need to look at, I'm just back from Burundi, where you know, the big challenge is to actually help refugees and displaced people that are returning home. They also need, you know, that education system needs reinforcement. But all of this points in one direction, the importance of peace. In a way, if we can conclude with a little slogan, we have to say that even if there is no peace, we have to ensure that the victims of war get an education. But we can also say that there will be no real peace without education. Well, I can't think of any better way to end this fascinating panel discussion. I thank my speakers and ask you to exit the stage. Thank you so much.